This is probably the wrong room for this joke, but I really want to work on it, so here we go. All right. Documentaries are fucking stupid. Woo! And people who make documentaries are even stupider. Yeah! So, sorry, that was the wrong room, but I really want to work on that joke. Um, my name is John Gorga. I'm the owner of Carmine Street Comics. So I'm uh, the cat wrangler of this crazy mess of a artistic commerce business thing. Well, we opened uh, May of 2013. Me and the uh, other founding owner had been managers for many years at a comic book store that was more uptown. Uh, and basically we learned that the store, uh, that the store was going to close. And uh, the owner said to us, uh, why don't you buy me out? And we said, cool. And then we looked into it and we said, no, because we don't want all this debt and all these problems. And basically, instead, we bought some assets of the business from our old boss. We didn't buy the whole business. And we, like, incorporated that into a new business we started ourselves that shares uh, physical retail space here with unoppressive, non-imperialist bargain books in the West Village. Well, the way the artist space element happened, um, it's kind of funny because it was not a part of the original idea. The original idea was just let's open a business and see if we can pay the bills being owners of a comic book store instead of being managers to see if we can pull it off. I, I really only told a very, 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 very few number of people that it was possible that I was about to own a comic book store. And one of the people I told is Ellen Steadfeld, who's one of my favorite people in New York. She's awesome. She's my best friend in this city. And um, she's really brilliant and really sweet. And she drew up quite a little like business plan. You know, I had uh, pitched the idea to John. <laughs> I said, John, you know, since you're either taking over this store or starting your own store, uh, you should have a, a space for artists. And I, as I recall, I, I wrote up a whole proposal um, for how this could work or just, you know, kind of pitched the idea to him and say, you know, if he was interested. And, uh, and he really liked it a lot too because it, it makes the store also more of a community space. Um, that it's, it gives it something unique. And then she said, well, just invite other people to use it. It could just be an open to the public table, not just for me. And then I was like, oh my God, that's so dumb. It's brilliant. That's so simple and like awesome and really makes it more about loving the medium and makes it supporting the artists. So I guess it was sort of a, a combination of different factors that got me thinking about this idea of having a table where our artists could create in the public space that it would be kind of like having a convention table but throughout the year kind of at any given time that it didn't have to just be on that one special day um it would be a chance to show the public what you're working on um and then also it's you know not quite as high pressure the public can come see what you're doing um you can kind of show some of your, your work in progress. Um, they can ask you some questions, you can get feedback. I mean, it kind of depends, I guess, on, on the artist. And then it worked out well that um, we kind of found a bunch of other artists who were also interested in that kind of idea. I met John through my journey of like making, starting to make comics. I had done a couple kids books at the time as an illustrator and um, I wanted to get more into comics. So I got, Got in contact with the company Pronto Comics, I think through New York Comic Con. And from there I met John, I met a bunch of people, and I would go to their old shop, Manhattan Comics and More, I believe it was called. I like, I like to accomplish two things when I do these flowers. I like to accomplish a main drawing that's not related to the flowers, and then I like to combine it with the part that's, that's like makes the flowers feel alive. So you know it's Marge, but you also feel like it's a flower collage. So, how I do that is using gravity. As you see, some of them are like falling down. So the goal is, as I go up, to start dispersing it realistically, to make it look as if it's really blowing in the wind or something like that. Everybody, the, the remarkable thing about John is he, he's got a way of, of reaching people deep into their souls. In a, um, and, and, and I don't know what it is. I, I've tried to analyze, for years now, I've tried to analyze what John Gorga, who he really is, what's, what's he all about. It's been puzzling at times. I mean, as, as sympathetic as he is, he's also one of the most obstinate people I've ever known, too. Um, and I say that with uh, uh, a, a degree of admiration. I mean, you know, he's resolute, he's, he's a bit of a maniac. He's um, right from the start. I mean, I can see all of those things, by the way. Um, and. Uh, I, uh, 
I've you know supported him right along all these years, um, even in the face of all kinds of uh, struggles and tribulations and trials. But um, we all do our best to support him, you know, because he's um, he's John Gorka, you know, he's um, he's one of a kind. Uh, Patrick Riley became the artisan residence, joining uh, Ellen as the artisan residence at the beginning. Uh, Ellen has since left as artisan residence, was replaced with an awesome dude by the name of Fabian, Fabian Lalay. Um, Patrick really kind of became the manager of the space. It is 9-11 on Thursday, January 17th, 2018. I thought you were about to tell me like where you were on 9-11. I just needed no, to... Said, okay, yeah, yeah no, I get it. Reference. No, I understand now, yeah. but you started with, it was 9-11 and I was a boy. <laughs> <laughs> like, anyway, what were you going to say? State your start, sorry. State your name for the record. Uh, Patrick J. Riley. Profession? None. <laughs> no, prof like actual profession or like fun profession? Uh, whichever you prefer. Uh, I guess cartoonist or comedian. Well, I mean, cartoonist technically. Like, I've, been, I've only been drawing my own stuff for like the last uh, four years, five years ish. But uh, yeah, so I guess I've been doing I've been doing comedy longer. But I started writing comics because I went to um, they used to go to Mike's at the Pit, and there was this thing where it was like they did this show called Comic Book Club where they would have, like, comic book people there, and I met this small publisher that was looking for writers and artists. And it actually, it's actually where I met John Gorga, who owns this place, was at this place called uh, Comic Book Club. It was just, like, nerds and comic comedian people, comic people. Um, they would just hang out and talk about stuff, and I met a small publisher, Pronto Comics, and then uh, through them I got into writing comics, and that was because I was going there to do stand-up and stuff. Wednesday, so oh, yeah. uh, I gotta get here early to talk to the fucking kids who want comics. When kids, I mean four-year-old men. Uh, I, what the fuck am I doing? I honestly had it off and I still had it in my hand. I'm like, you're better than this. Uh, no, I'm not. I, you got, I, I got my dog registered as a uh, service animal, like a therapy dog. Do you know you can just do that and no one asks questions? <laughs> it's not like a form a doctor has to fill out. <laughs> John and I were friends, and uh, he opened this place. I started coming in to help out a little here or there. And then now it's a curse. Now it's a curse that I'm here. It's kind of like I turned away an old hag with a rose, and now I'm the beast. What was it like meeting Patrick J. Riley? Well, that was... That was um... There's so much that can be said about him. The first thing I'm going to say is you don't want to make him an enemy. You don't want to get on the wrong side of Patrick J. Bradley ever. So I'm going to be very careful about what I say from here on in. He's iconic, and that's, you know, he's not only iconic, but he's also iconoclastic, you know. Um, he just tears down everything and anything he can. He's, he's kind of like the opposite of John Gorga in terms of um, any intrinsic empathy you know you feel like uh oh what's gonna patrick gonna do next so what started this was i started shooting a web show here called carmax repicks and then uh i would shoot carmax repicks here and then i was like well i mean if we have the space to shoot a web show why don't i do a monthly show so i started doing a monthly show that we did called new comics day which is now run by nick Nasia. Nick, is that how you say your last name? Sure. All right. Facebook has been getting in a lot of trouble, stealing all our data, which, duh, of course they are. But I do think um, one thing that Facebook has done that's good is they put in that, uh, that like, safety alert feed. Like, if you're in a, the area of a disaster, you could go on Facebook and say and mark yourself safe. I think that is actually good. That's one of the few useful things that Facebook does. But some people do abuse that feature. Uh, my cousin, recently, uh, a couple years back, there was an uh, earthquake in Nepal. And she marked herself safe. And I'm like, yeah, you, you don't have a passport if you live in West Virginia. Like, you're not going to Nepal. Like, <laughs> we all knew you were safe. Uh, yeah, I don't think the girl uh, who keeps saying uh, why, uh, keeps asking why she can't use the N-word when they do is really, like, into spiritual shit and traveling. I don't think she's, you take the girl out of West Virginia, but, man, she hates black people. I don't know what her deal is. <laughs> know what they ever did to her. Got a lot of problems. What was it like the first time meeting John Gorga? Oh, John. Um, it's a good day. He knows his stuff, but uh, I've been to a lot of comic book stores in my life. Just uh, Usually, uh, if I go to a new city for the first time, for example, I like to check out a comic book store. And usually, like, the guys behind the counter are knowledgeable, but John is knowledgeable and also not awful. 
to deal with, which is something you do run into in comic book stores. Uh, John is not going to shame you for liking dumb comic books. Uh, he's just going to be like, I'll add it to your pull list. Like that's John, John's a good, uh, John's a good dude to be running a comic book store. I think, I think he's got the knowledge and the actual customer. He's got things covered on the customer service and, and that a lot of comic book store owners do not. What do you think is the strangest thing about the New York city open mic scene? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think this is the case anywhere, but just it's kind of more uh, obvious in the city just because there's so many people here. Uh, there's no barrier to entry to most open mics. You can kind of just wander in an open mic and do your own thing. So you see some people who, uh, they're not really stand-up comedians. You, you see some interesting things of people just rambling. and uh, But other than that, I think the other thing is uh, it's kind of weird. Um, there are kind of like clicks at open mics. Like if you go to a mic, let's say in Bushwick, it's going to be very different than a mic in Astoria or Manhattan or uh, Long Island City. It's just uh, different people kind of gravitate towards different mics and then it kind of affects the scene that way. There's sometimes not a lot of crossover. A couple months into that, I started a mic simply because I knew it would be a way to kind of bring newer people into the store and also you know get like a little more of a community here because that's all i really wanted with this place was to make it a community and it's like with the artist window and like every, all the events and shit we do i'm not a big people person i i kind of look weird <laughs> i've had women just here run off from me because like they dropped their pocketbook and i pick it up and try to give them and they're like ah get away from me ah! <laughs> and john from day one has always been community oriented. We're there for the artists. We're there for the comedians, um, which is good because not a lot of stores can basically say, we can get you a signing within a week. You know, it's a dollar minimum for an open mic or a show. So I was at the 9-11 Memorial Museum uh, a couple years ago, and uh, anybody been? Anybody ever been? Clap it over you've been. Don't clap. Silently, yeah. remem silently remember if you've been to the m museum. Uh, I was there. I don't want to spoil anything if you haven't been. It's sad. Uh, but also, I think it's sadder than it needs to be. Um, there was literally a room that was smaller than this room where they just showed you pictures of everyone who died in 9-11 in a slideshow. Like, just the saddest slideshow where it'll be like, Greg was 55 years old, uh, electric engineer, died on impact when the plane hit. Terrible, obviously. Uh, but then they showed Skyler, who was 21 years old, and his biggest dream was to make it on Wall Street. And he had blonde spiked hair and two pop collars, and my first thought was, fuck that guy, I'm glad he's dead. <laughs> yeah, see, no, it's, for, they say 9-11 changed everything, and for the 10 people Skyler didn't date rape, it did. <laughs> Like we're gonna sit here and pretend everybody who died in 9/11 was a good person. It was in the financial district. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like it's a bad place. Like statistically speaking, three pedophiles died in 9/11. We have to call them heroes. Uh. Patrick J. Riley. Uh, he is a force. I first met him at the Creek in the Cave, uh, doing an open mic downstairs, and um, I, I don't know. He's just a ball of sunshine. I got, hey guys, can you shut the fuck up? Patrick's what? talking? Patrick's talking! <laughs> this is my time! I definitely find the New York comedy scene has a gender imbalance. Um, most mics that I go to are more men than women, and, uh, and it can be overwhelming. I've had a lot of conversations with women about what it's like to go to mics and how they handle it. I, um... I like comic book stores uh, because of superheroes, because most superheroes are orphans, and I am an orphan, and it makes me feel really powerful, <laughs> right? Uh, I think, I, I like it. it. It actually did give me unrealistic expectations, though, when I was growing up. I mean, we have, like, Cinderella. Cinderella's not a superhero, but, like, think, think of fairy tales, stories, uh, superheroes. I mean, like, Cinderella, Harry Potter, Batman, right? <laughs> Yeah, I thought that I was going to be a princess, or have magical powers, or have enough money to buy magical powers. So, <laughs> that's a slam on Batman. <laughs> Take that, Batman. No, I'm, I'm hard on Batman because I sort of see myself in him. 
my parents died when I was young and they left me a little bit of cash and now I'm in Gotham City fighting clowns. <laughs> <laughs> Similarities are scary. A penguin bit me once. <laughs> that is a true story. A penguin bit my butt in Argentina. <laughs> yes. You're coming up against a lot of aggression. I think that comedy can be like a very angry art form. Um, and that's something beautiful about it. But when you're in rooms with younger men who might have a lot of anger about not uh, having enough women sleep with them, then that can be overwhelming for a young female comedian. Um, and so I think it scares off a lot of people at the beginning. Um, I particularly try to create spaces where there can be more women. Uh, and the shows that I book, I put a lot of thought into booking uh, even or if not saturated more with women and LGBT artists and artists of color. I, I just want there to be more of those voices out there. Mostly because um, audiences get bored. If they see the same person up over and over and over again, they fall asleep. Uh, so, you know, helping other people and making a better show at the same time, I don't see any reason why not to do it. But no, I, uh, I actually recently, like about a month ago, I had my first uh, trans-related surgery. I had a, a tracheal shave. I got rid of my fucking Adam's apple. Uh, or, as I've been describing it to people, I retired Randy Johnson. Thank you. <laughs> Bench that fucker. <laughs> Prominent Adam's apple. <laughs> Uh, but no, so that, that's done, that's cool. Now my next thing is, um, excuse me, too many Skittles. Um, <laughs> the next thing I'm saving up for is, uh, FFS, Facial Feminization Surgery. Nice. Yeah, it's a, it's a bunch of hardcore plastic surgery procedures to, like, you know, take the dude out of my face, you know? <laughs> You guys fucking know what I'm talking yeah. about. I got all these, a lot of hard lines. It looks like you, you know, a rubber witch's mask. I get it. Um, no, I'm gonna get a. Um, I want to get a uh, a brow reduction. You know, you know, take out all the like the you know cavemanish of it. I want to contour the, the the sides of my chin, make it nice and round. And uh, I'm gonna get a rhinoplasty because Lahayim. So, <laughs> I realize this. You know. When I was 13, I had a bar mitzvah to become a man. Now at 31, I'm going to have a nose job to become a proper Jewish woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's the initiation. I'll finally be part of the club. What's that? Oh, man. Well, let's see. How long have I been doing art? Uh, well, I should say all my life, but professionally since 2007. I met John at a Darren draw in the city in 2008. But I really didn't know him. I knew of him, but I really didn't know him. It wasn't until I actually, me and him, started uh, going working for a comic book company called Pronto Comics, where we uh, kind of hit it off. But yeah, I, I got involved like pretty much in the beginning, where he was just having people just sit there and actually start drawing. He had so many artists from the beginning, from Pronto, a couple of guys who were just selling their comic books and selling their zines. But he, yeah, he opened up that avenue for me to actually get more exposure. A lot of times I've actually, people have actually bought stuff right off my hands because usually I, I keep it simple like a dwarf, an elf, or I, I, I love drawing characters and creating characters just on the whim, like character, character concepts. And people just like bought it and I was like, hey John, uh, I got money, what should I do with it? Like, you know, being like that type of person, like, oh wait, so, so I basically say, well here John, thanks for the, for the, for the, and he goes, oh no, no, keep it, it's like, that's for you, your drawings, and I was like, yeah, but I'm using your space, he goes, yeah, for free, uh, I don't feel comfortable with this, so that was like, like the first time I ever drew on his spot, I made money within like a few hours, and then just couldn't have the phantom ideas, oh yes, I need this, but he also needs this too, so like, it was it was a very funny. We split it, and I, I went home with money and enjoyed it with like a I enjoyed it with some uh, tacos. That's basically how it. That's how it. That's how it happened. Like I went home, bought myself a taco, a couple of drinks, and I was happy. Um, and some of you guys are looking at me like, yo, this is like the tallest like black Mexican I ever saw in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's like, yo, like, after this, we can run a 5 on 5, bro. You're probably gonna get us some rebounds. <laughs> and someone's like, yo, but I do need that leaky faucet in my house fixed. Can you do something about that? <laughs> um, I'm 23 years old, so, Woo! like, it's supposed to be my... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so when you associate your age, you associate your, some people associate age with like jersey numbers and stuff. So 23 is supposed to be Michael Jordan. It's my Jordan year. 24 is Kobe. I'm supposed to like reinvent myself. I'm not really looking forward to be 32. <laughs> that was OJ's number. <laughs> I can't even like pretend to be like when I'm 31, I could be in an interracial relationship with a girl who'd be like, hey baby, I'm cutting, I got the knife again. Ah. She's like, Derek, stop, you stupid. <laughs> I turn 32, I'm like, hey baby, I got the knife again. Ah. She's like, Derek, stop! You're stupid. <laughs> uh the mics at Carmine Street Comics. I remember I went to one of the mics there with a comic that isn't a regular. And he was saying how uh, the comics there are weirdos or something to that nature. And I'm just like, you just don't understand the crowd, you know? Uh, Carmine Street, a lot of comics there that I don't see other places, which is good. They're a different audience and different ears. Um, I think they can be a little zany or weird, but I, I, uh, I connect with that. Carmine Street Comics is how comedy should be. It's like in any local business. Like, it, that's where art is created or done. and. Um, you also get to be around a really amazing part of Manhattan. Yeah, people there are little weirdos. But like, I'm a weirdo too, so it, I am very comfortable there. Uh, what it's like meeting or knowing John Gorga? John's interesting. He's, uh, he knows a lot about a lot of different things. Um, he loves comics. He's, uh, he's a truly sweet dude. He's a good person to talk to. Very, 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 very empathetic. You can't help but like John, even if, uh, you know, some things might not go well in certain situations, but I mean, so he's a he's a he's a very kind and kind and smart guy. What can you tell us about the first time meeting John Gorga? <laughs> um, so I was new to New York, and I was sort of looking for the comic book store. I wanted to make my home base comic book store the one I wanted to hang out with and argue about superheroes with people at. And uh, I wandered in here one day, and the first thing that I saw was. Pat Riley sitting at the artist space um, and he said, I'm drawing fat superheroes. Do you want one? And I said, yes. Can I have a fat winter soldier? And he drew it for me and it was phenomenal and it's still in my fridge. And then I listened to him and John argue for 10 minutes and uh, I fell in love a little bit with the whole insane place. What well, can you tell us about the store that makes it unique, do you think? I mean, everything. Everything about this store is unique. It's tiny and weird and it's two stores in one and it's uh old school west village scrappy you know it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's been papered over or it's been you know infused a lot of corporate money it's really like a guy who loves comics building it up by himself with friends helping him out um you know it's there's a reason why i came and just helped out for free for a really long time it's because i really love the store, it feels like a real community and it feels like a community not just for white male comic book fans, but for all kinds of comic book fans. Uh, I felt comfortable here and welcome here immediately and that's not common. Tell us about the first time you met John Gorga, owner of Carmine Street Comics. I think I probably met him at one of the open mics here where I came in and um, Patrick had lied to me and said I own a comic book store and then I came here and there was someone who was not Patrick operating the store. Um, and John had heard about me and was like, hey, Kevin, good to see you, but I'd never met him, and I was very confused. <laughs> and uh, that's a tradition we keep up to this day, where he comes in and he's like, hey, nice to see you, and I'm like, I have no idea who this guy is. I know him very well. He's a nice guy. This is fun. This is, uh, this is a lot more fun than it looks sitting there. It actually looks very uh, strange. It's a huge fire hazard, but we're having a good time. You know, honestly, here's where my bar is for comedy shows. I like any comedy show where everyone is here on purpose. That's it. That's all I mean. I'll even say most people are here on purpose. That's that's. I've been doing comedy a, a few years, and and I I'll take fifty one percent of the room has to be here on purpose. The rest, it's fine. I've been doing a lot of these shows. Uh, that are known as ambush comedy shows in the comedy community. Um, for the folks at home, everyone here is on the show, but for you at home, uh, an ambush comedy show, if you don't know, that, that's when there's like a bar and a bunch of people are at the bar having drinks and having a good time, and then comedians come in and ruin that good time. <laughs> I was on one of these shows recently where uh, there are a bunch of people having their drinks, having a good time up at the bar, and then somebody went up on stage, took a microphone out of nowhere and said, Hey, everybody, we're going to get a comedy show started now. <laughs> and everyone at the bar just turned and went, all right, I guess this is happening. And <laughs> begrudgingly looked at the comedy show. 
Faust, what's the most difficult thing about the New York City open mic scene? Um, places close down. Uh, usually if comedians are, in, sorry Jim, but uh, usually when comedians are let into your establishment, it's a, uh, it's a sign that your business is about to uh, collapse. Uh, most bars that are like, yeah, open mics, what a great idea, uh, tend to be on their last leg for the most part. I've seen a lot of bars uh, that had great open mics uh, disappear, which is always sad. Um, you also have to deal with a lot of um, uh, large egos on people that have done nothing to deserve those large egos. Um, a lot of people who think they're going to be the next uh, edgy Bill Hicks, um, but what they don't realize is that they're uh, they're terrible. They're ter if you're watching this right now, I think you're terrible, <laughs> and you know who you are. Um, do I get any weird interactions with the comedians that aren't into comics? Well, definitely. Increasingly, what's uh, I'm I'm like losing my cool more and more with the ones that just want to hand me a dollar and uh, don't want to buy anything. <laughs> like uh, the first time someone did it, I was dumbfounded because I was like, "You, you literally just want to give me a dollar for the time when what I was offering you was you could get you hand me a dollar and you get something and you get the time." And they were like, "Yeah, yeah, man, I don't want to bother. I'll just hand you a buck." To which I was sort of like. Uh, all right, sure. I guess what place am I in to uh, turn down the, the just the dollar and hold on to some product? But then when it started to happen more and more, it started to become like they overheard someone else doing it. And God, the idea that like they're avoiding comics, like or they're just bypassing the comics, like literally the comics were there almost like as a freebie because they were paying me for the time was the way they were looking at it. And they don't even want comics for free. And as someone who loves this medium and literally founded a store and has devoted my entire life to trying to get more appreciation, weeks will pass where there aren't amazing comics that are changing my life, right? But then there, every couple months there's something else that comes along that I think is genuinely important and has something to say. And the world is missing out on that. Or that's not healthy for people either. Um, it's not healthy for this world in general. That entire messages are, that people are putting effort into getting out there are just being lost. Yeah, so now I've had some interactions where I've yelled at them. <laughs> Because I'm sort of like, uh, I'm nice to my customers. It's customer service. You're supposed to be nice to all your customers. If you're a comedian and you're here and you're giving me a dollar and you're not buying comics, you're not a customer anymore. If you're doing that every week, you're not a customer. You're a person who's passing through my space and telling jokes. And um, if you also literally aren't just tolerating comedy, if you're not even going to tolerate sequential art, but you're going to be in this space just for the comedy time, well, fuck you. <laughs> you. It used to be before Trump was president, you had to like have a really good Trump impersonation. But now you could just literally get on stage and go like, uh, fake news. And like the crowd will just eat it up. Like that's what I love is that it's like the greatest party trick ever. You could just be like, uh, and everyone's like, oh my God, it's so fucking funny. Um, and all you gotta do, all I gotta figure out how you do an impression. You know, like kind of like take a mob boss, you know, you take like, you know, uh, uh, Marlon Brando from Godfather. You're like, oh, make him an alpha again. For, and just make him kind of sassy. You know, like that's all you gotta do is do that in order to do a Trump impersonation. Um, and also, he never closes his thumb or forefinger, so be even more angry at him. That's what someone told me. Was, I was, originally, I was doing this, and then someone was like, yeah, you know he never closes his thumb and forefinger. And I'm just like, now I hate him even more. Like, that's, that's some OCD shit that is just kicking up in me right now. Oh. Um, do you think it's weird for other comedians who aren't into comic books to do comedy in a comic book shop? It's, I don't think it's weird for comedians who are not into comic books to do stand-up in a comic book shop. I, like, personally, I'm not a big fan of comic books, you know? Like, I, I like Batman. Like, you ask John, every time I go do the open mic, I only buy Batman comics. Uh, but I just like being in that environment of people that enjoy comic books and superheroes. For some reason, when you perform there, you feel like it's much more supportive than anywhere else in the city. Like, uh, when I walk in there, I feel like people people definitely want to be there. And whether that's because of the comic books or not, I feel like it's just built a, a supportive community. Do you think there's any interesting, weird memories from the store? What's weird about the store is... The store? <laughs> it's all insane! This is a pile of comics masquerading as a business, and it works, and I love that. Uh, it's, it's on... 
you know, a huge traffic area of the West Village, so there's always people coming in who have no idea what they're about to find in here, and then they end up talking about Bob Dylan with Jim for five hours, or, uh, or a, you know, a, a, a kid comes in and I give them their first Moon Girl comic, and it's like the best moment of my day. I gave a little girl a free Moon Girl comic once, and she hugged me. It was like the best moment of my life. Um, yeah, the, the, the sheer fact that this store exists and works and is two different businesses crammed together, one like everything's vintage and the other everything's coming in once a week, uh, and that the two groups of people who shop here also somehow coexist together, like the old school used book fans and the Spider-Man junkies, like they're all here together and they all get along and people become friends and somehow it all becomes one weird giant ball of nerds. Please give a warm welcome to Maurice Licorice! Woo! Yeah. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you internet, how's everybody doing? Yeah. I'm a man of my word. Yeah, I'm wearing this card again. Uh, yeah, nah man, let's let's just dive right into it. Uh, name's Maurice Licorice, that's, uh, that's real. Real first, real last name. I feel like I gotta start off all my sets that way. <laughs> Mainly because at one point, one dude after a show was just like, oh, wait, you, licorice? <laughs> I get it. It's because you're black and bitter. And I was just like, <laughs> in that moment, I just, well, I was definitely one of those things before you opened your mouth. <laughs> and now I'm both. It's a self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy. Get out of my face. So, mm -hmm. No, like, I, I, it's fine. I love it. How would you describe the qualities of the New York open mic scene? Very cynical. Very uh, hungry, very lonely, but also very ambitious. Do you think there's a particular kind of hassle with what stand-up comedians describe as the grind? Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, I think that, well, the reason that I pretty much quit stand-up was things like when you grind in stand-up, which is, you know, going out every single night and doing open mics as much as you can, maybe like three to five times a night, it's extremely emotionally and physically draining, and most of what grinding and doing stand-up is, is not actually doing stand-up. It's just networking and schmoozing and kind of fake being friends with people so that you hope you get booked on the shows and self-promotion basically which is like any entertainment career I'm assuming another thing about why I really disliked it was this glorification of just general poverty and being a failure in life and not put together as being somehow funnier or better than being a normal person with a good job um, and how the more someone's life spiraled down the drain just the more laughs they would get about it and I found that to be kind of really fucked up and also a glorification of pretty much like mental illness in a lot of cases uh, depression or bipolar or this extreme emotional instability just is very much used as fuel in comedy for jokes, um, which can work, but I just found that it was not a good headspace to be in. I, uh, I've been dating a little bit recently. I went through a breakup. Um, breakups can be jarring and they change your life. You know what I mean? Like I was in love with this guy. I thought we were going to get married. I mean, we dated for two and a half weeks and uh, <laughs> he's gone. Uh, no, that was like a joke. Okay. <laughs> one and a half years is how long I dated him for. And during, actually, here's a funny story. One and a half years, during our relationship, I lost 50 pounds. So when I broke up with him, all my friends were like, Maddie, did you break up with him because you're hot now? <laughs> what the fuck? No. I broke up with him because he's still ugly. Okay. No. Did you guys know you can do that? I woke up one day, looked in the mirror, and was like, oh, I'm a 7.1. Bye. <laughs> Very empowering. What makes Carmine Street unique in New York? It attracts like a very strange but also like receptive group of comics because like any open mic in New York, it's not really, there's not going to be any audience member. That's, that's something I can reckon with. That's totally fine. You know, I get it. Um, but I feel like people are relatively receptive and you can like 
pitch jokes and work on things at Carmine. I always advocate for it when people ask for mics to do. And I think people are just like, what's that? I haven't heard of that or whatever, because it is kind of weird and tucked away. Like it, it's an, an anomaly in a larger mic scene. It's like this really small little space in the West Village. So, you know, it's something that ordinarily probably shouldn't exist, but it does in this case. Describe the store in a word. Describe the store in a word. Hmm. Human. That's right, it's human. It has its faults, it has its strengths. It has positive and negative, but all around, it's human. I have really, I've really immature friends. Every time I pass out drinking, they draw a forehead on my penis. <laughs> when I'm uncircumcised, they like pull that shit back and draw on the pink part. It's really gross. <laughs> <laughs> <It's so fun. laughs> what attracted you to doing the mic at Carmine Street? The price. <laughs> it's a dollar. And uh, then you just keep coming back because this place is... Uh, it's like a family, man. No, it's a really good, it's, you got a good room here. You, this place, it's not hard to fill up. You break every fire code violation, by the way, when then you get a lot of people in this room. Who are the comics you admire in the open mic scene? The comics I admire in the open mic scene. He's not so much in the open mic scene anymore, but it's Usama Siddiqui is definitely one of them. He, I mean, he, motherfucker still comes to this mic. He got past at the cellar and he's still grinding his ass here. You know how much of an asshole that makes him? No. <laughs> He's a good guy. Jamie Wolf's another good guy. I love whatever he does. Uh, Leland Long. F God damn it, that guy's funny. You know how infuriating that is? You know how infuriating it is that you're asking me this question? Ginny Hogan's another funny person. You know, they're all fucking funny. I'm here at 5 o'clock doing a documentary. It's better make it to cons. How's it going? Sit back down, boy. Not as brown. Three minutes. This will be fine. Three minutes. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Unless this goes really well, and I might run the light. <laughs> you never know with me, man. You never know. I'm the BET of car mice. You don't even know. You don't even know what's going to happen. Uh, dude, I feel like uh, Jay had just made my mind go run wild. I was like, what other bands have like these sort of... Uh, things attached to them. Vampire Weekend seems to be the perfect band for woke people, right? <laughs> because it's like too vague to be offensive to anybody, but also like arrogant at the same time, right? <laughs> Vampire Weekend, official <laughs> band of the woke, I think. <laughs> I don't know, I feel like uh, we're getting into a place now where everyone, it's just like, uh, there's two camps, right? If you, you tend to be offended or you tend to be not offended. Those are the two camps. And on both extremes is bad, right? Because on the one hand, you you get the person who's always offended, and you get the person who's never offended, and that's like a combat what? No, it's nothing. You know, you know, am I biting your bit or something? Am I biting your hot bit? I was snapping because I was agreeing with you. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Correct response. <laughs> Correct response. <laughs> okay. I mean, dude, you've seen open mics. Someone laughs at you. You're like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you doing the thing that I'm fighting for? <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's a weird environment. Mercer, don't think, think that's always chill. And everyone's just even, okay? You know how to set where you're doing well, the one joke bombs, and you're like, what the fuck is going on here? The fuck the fuck? That was the one joke I wanted to work. The other two jokes were just build up for the one joke that was actually what I was putting my emotional validation on. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> so I feel like there's, uh, the because both sides suck, right? On the extreme, you got the one person who's always offended, right? It's that, you know, we are we, we know this person. It's the girl, the white girl, who's always named Lindy every time. <laughs> Never not named Lindy. Always named Lindy. <laughs> Haven't gotten laid in years, angry, always on your ass about stuff, right? You can just be like, hey, Lindy, how do you do? She's like, ah, uh, that's offensive to dead people who can't no longer do, okay? <laughs> and you're like, what? Uh, what? And you're like, yeah, also, how can be uh, triggering for people who dated guys named how, okay? So, <laughs> check your privilege. <laughs> and then you have that girl, and then you have the other side who's also a piece of shit, right? The guy named Jeff, always. Always named Jeff. <laughs> Always named Chef, who's always got that. He's always he's always saying, take no prisoners. That's always what he's saying. <laughs> I, don't, I don't take no prisoners, bitch. I don't. Listen, I don't. Listen. He always makes shitty metaphors. He always makes really bad metaphors. Listen, hey, 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 hey. If you can't, if you can't handle the... 
don't come into the, into the lion's den. <laughs> Unless you're trying to get scratched. All right? <laughs> that, that's what Jeff's saying. Don't come in. Don't don't play with the hyenas. Don't 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 play with my dreidel. Unless you're trying to get spun or something. <laughs> He's always doing some shitty metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Jeff, right? We all know Jeff. I don't know, man. It's it's weird because like, I I, the, here's the thing, I think we are the world is tending towards being offended based on words, regardless of what's happening. We're we're seeing what's happening. Crazy, crazy, just happening, and we're still think, looking at the the offensiveness of it. Like I was in a bus in Dallas, right, with my friend, and a uh, white dude got stabbed by a black dude. Black dude ran off. White dude screamed the N word, and my friend was like, "Can you believe it?" White guy screaming the N-word? <laughs> I'm like, that's the craziest thing about what we just saw? <laughs> can I, can I, can maybe, maybe, a, maybe a white guy can be racist during his own stabbing. Can we do that? <laughs> maybe he gets to be racist during his own stabbing. Yes? Can we do that, black guy? Yes? <laughs> I just feel like, who is logical and, and progressive during his own stabbing? Who's that guy? Who's that guy? Who's like, oh, <laughs> this is due to socioeconomic factors. <laughs> the weirdest thing I've ever seen in an open mic circuit in New York, and I would be very surprised if this hasn't already been said 12 fucking times for this documentary, is there's a lady at the creek in the cave, and she strips on stage, and it's and she's older, she's in her, like, she's got to be in her 60s, and she strips on stage. It's the most uncomfortable thing. And she'll sing a song while stripping. It's, um... Yeah, that takes the cake right there. I don't know. I, I can't think of anything weirder than that. Unless someone brings a gun. That would be kind of weird. It would be funny. What what song is it? Oh, it's different. It's a different song every fucking time. <laughs> you know, that's the different part. Like, she'll strip. Fuck, dude. It's so uncomfortable. I have this. I that's You know what's the fucked up part? That's the last naked woman I've seen. <laughs> it's a 60-year-old woman <laughs> stripping on stage. Help me. Uh, it's not okay. All right, man. The comedians and the open mics were sometimes at cross purposes to me because I was trying to organize boxes of comics and then the comedians had to move them in order to have space to stand a new comedy. But it also uh, opened up my community. Again, it opened up my community to all these new people, uh, some really great people who have become my friends. Uh, and again, I think the most important thing about this place is that it's so welcoming to all kinds of people, all kinds of New Yorkers, all kinds of um, comic book fans and non-comic book fans, that it becomes this very singular collage of weirdos <laughs> who all like similar things and are nerdy together. And uh, I don't know a lot of other stores that would sort of open their doors, especially in this small of a space, to comedians for open mics and have that be something that continued and was such an iconic part of the store. I don't know many places that would inconvenience themselves in that way to do that because it's nice for the community and because it's cool art. Oh, my, uh, my other favorite memory from the store is, and I'm not gonna use any names, but we were sitting around one day, there were about four worker slash volunteer slash helpers hanging out and uh, it was a really slow day and I think I said we need to rank the 20 hottest superheroes and then we spent about four hours arguing back and forth about who the sexiest 20 superheroes were uh, and it got very heated and I feel like I learned a lot about everybody because where you rank Aquaman I feel like tells me a lot about you as a person. The mics in those shows, since they are at the tail end of our day, they don't bring in, in as much money as we would like them to. Um, what I'm more referring to is the dollar minimum for the, the mics on Sundays. Um, but because we are a business, we are trying to survive in New York City, in the West Village. Not to get too personal, but this neighborhood has been losing businesses left and right. And it's increasingly hard for a comic book store or even a bookstore 
to operate with what we're trying to do. I, I, I have like way too little time. Yes, I need that dollar to keep the store open, but the goal of the place, I don't, money is a, a means to an end. Money isn't gonna make me happy. Money isn't gonna solve the problems. Money is just to keep the doors open so I keep, can keep trying to solve problems. And the problem I'm trying to solve is I'm trying to make people realize that there are comics coming out all the time that have important things to say. So if you're not taking home the comic and you're just giving me a dollar, then why am I here? If it's comics that you chase, calm on streets your place. If you're not sure what's your taste, John ought to set you straight. They got superheroes and independent and a little bit of mystery and horror to sci-fi and am I all types of genre. Visit Carmine Street Comics today and you just may be back tomorrow. If it's comics that you chase, Carmine Street's your place. If you're not sure what's your taste, John ought to set you straight. Said if it's comics that you chase, Carmine Street's your place. <laughs> that, was, that was magnificent. Thanks, brother. <laughs> yeah, what's your name again, man? Josh. Josh, man. Yeah, cool. Yeah, man. Yeah, if you, if you feel free to use that anywhere, man. Oh, Just let me know where you're putting it, man. I'm all down. That's oh, the song. That's the Carmine Street Comics song, man. Oh, thanks, man.